Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. But today, as you can see, I am joined by my very wonderful, very patient, very long-suffering husband. Because we took another trip to the cinema, this time to see Mary Queen of Scots. And so we thought we'd sit down and share just what we thought of that film. So I think the best place for us to start was with you telling everybody what you really were looking forward to with this film. What what made you keen to go and see it, apart from me forcing you? Apart from you forcing me to go and see this. <laughs> yeah, which I definitely did. <laughs> there was so much to look forward to. Mm -hmm. uh, casting being the very obvious one, aside from the two leading ladies who are probably two of the best known names in Hollywood at the moment. Certainly. Uh, there were so many names I actually had to make a list. So uh, the people we could look forward to seeing in this film include Martin Compton of Lion Duty, James McCardle, Jack Loudon, Adrian Lester, who has been in everything forever, uh -huh. uh, Gemma Chan, Guy Pearce, Ian Hart, David Tennant, Joe Alwyn, and, uh, although I didn't notice this at the time, Simon Russell Bill. It's probably not a surprise that Simon Russell Bill popped up in it, uh, in addition to a number of other actors who are uh, well known stage performers. David Tennant, been a very obvious one. Absolutely. Um, Largely because the director of the film mm -hmm. is the first step behind the camera when the uh, first cinema steps behind the camera for the artistic director of the Dolma, Josie Rourke. So you've got a theatre director Don't. making, directing a film. That's really interesting. That, I think that can have some quite interesting effects. It doesn't always work, but no, it can be no, really interesting. But exactly, it can bring something different to the way it's shot and yes. the way. Particularly because in theatre, you you have that closeness with the audience. Another very interesting thing was to see the first one, well, one of the first attempts at cinema by the um, writer. Obviously, it's an adaptation of a book, and the screenplay was written by Bo Willimon. Most people recognise his name from the opening sequence of House of Cards. So again, something quite different, quite unusual. Quite excited to see what was going to happen. Yes. Well, I suppose when it, with House of Cards, it's a lot of strong women and, and heavy political intrigue and backstabbing. So the royal courts of Tudor England and perhaps Renaissance Europe make quite, I think, good fodder for a writer like that, to be honest. Absolutely. It's perfectly sound logic there. Yes. Um, political discourse. Um, and Scheming. Scheming. <laughs> Machinations. <laughs> large casts, all of whom playing varying, degree, um, varying degrees of importance in the story. Mm -hmm. Almost logical fit. I think so. Um, that same logic could also be applied to the cinematographer, John Matheson, who we probably know best for Gladiator. So he made the Roman Colosseum so exciting. And again, when you think about it, quite a logical fit. Yes, and also when I think about some of the elements of the film where you have what some bits look, frankly, like an advert for Visit Scotland. Yes. This is a, this is a film cinematographer, filmmaker, who loves landscape, who loves buildings and the way they work. So actually Gladiator, when I think about the Colosseum, that then reads quite correctly. I do think there were some odd choices with some cinematography that I'd like you to explain, but carry on with what you were saying. Um, finally, the wardrobe mm -hmm. was designed by Alexandra Burke, who we know... Not the singer. Uh, not, not the singer. <laughs> um, we know that she's worked on Guardians of the Galaxy, Doctor Strange, and also... Um, four. Oh, uh, well, perhaps that explains the bloody leather trousers. Again, it's, <laughs> it's an interesting choice to make. Yes. So, well, ultimately, what we can conclude from that is there is a lot of potential there Ye and so many different avenues to explore and enjoy. There was one scene which I particularly enjoyed. I think it was the best scene in the whole film. Um, I will mention the barn. Only because I could finally see what that theatrical knowledge and presence can bring to film. Mm -hmm. And it was barnstorming. Oh, the yeah. The way it was put together, <laughs> it, told the, it told a fantastic story in that scene alone. How these two women, mm. in very similar situations, but with quite clear differences, yeah. go, living very similar lives, but making different choices, 
both victims of their time and their own character? Yes, I mean, we will get on to the history angles of it and the choices that were made and the interpretations that were made. But in terms of the shots, like I think, I think that, that whole sequence, like you said, in the barn was spectacular. It was beautiful. There were some cinematography choices that I found quite um, distorting. So we have these large, long, wide shots of rolling Scots hills, which was it filmed on location in Scotland? I believe it was. Oh, wow. Okay, so beautiful landscape. It is an advert for visiting That's Scotland. The it's... lowlands of Scotland. That's the Scottish Tourism Board were the big winners in this film. I mean, it's, it's utterly beautiful. Um, and I think some of the interior shots are... They make really interesting use of buildings and spaces exteriorly and, and the interiors as well. There's the moment where Elizabeth's up on the leads of what I think may have been Hardwick Hall. I'm not sure. Um, and it's just epic landscape. But there were some moments where, I don't know if they used a different camera, but it almost looked like the quality of the camera dropped. It became almost quite soap-like. So we'd go from <clears> this beautiful, long, this epic true epic cinema you know of the style of gladiator and then we'd come into these small moments of, of usually in a fight sequence and it would just the perspective would alter and the clarity would alter and i don't know if the frames per second would alter but it suddenly started to look more jarring and it, it really pulled me out of the moment i I didn't like that choice i'm sure people did but for me i was like why this is really it looked to me like it had been filmed or not a film camera. You can get away with those jumping between um, parts of the story, which again, were covering a large period of history. And there were moments when it was done fantastically well. The, towards the end, when we see Elizabeth walking down the corridor, each time in different clothes, Margot Robbie being aged just that little bit more every time. I see, I, I don't see her as being aged. I see her, her makeup becoming more heavy and her becoming more clownish. That's the one thing that none of them seem to age to me. But we know that that's trying to catch up on um, the amount of time which elapses yes, between yes. the previous scene and the one which follows. Yes. And I think arguably what they're <laughs> trying to do is that that mask of youth that Elizabeth puts on in her image making, that is perhaps reflected that she's actually becoming less human, which is something they pick up at the end of the film. So, yes, I can see that that, that elapse of time is happening. And if the screenplay had been where it should have been, mm. we probably wouldn't be talking about this in a negative way or in a difficult way. But I'm afraid that just didn't work. No, the screen. I don't think the screenplay worked. Work I don't think it worked. It's a real shame because I absolutely love so many of the actors, and I don't think the performances are bad. But as you say, I agree with you. I think that the screenplay is kind of woeful it brings it, it's the thing which topples so many of the other probably not groundbreaking piece of work it's mm -hmm. the direction it's well good intentions but it's not necessarily carried off the, the number of uh, montages within the film where they try to show the different fortunes of the two women didn't quite work yes the kind of virtual split screening the moment where mary's just given birth to james and she's on sheets and there's lots of blood between her legs whereas elizabeth has been curling paper flowers i'm not sure if that was an elizabethan craft i don't know it, it looks like you find on etsy today the curling of paper and all of these red flowers sit between her legs and i understand why a director or a cinematographer might storyboard that that's the sort of thing that gets storyboarded at three in the morning and then should get scrapped because it's it's that kind of split screening that takes the audience by the hand and is frankly a little patronising. Look how different they are. You can see it visually here. We know how different they are. We can see it. We don't require this arguably very beautiful shot, but quite it was cliched to me. What would have worked on stage may just couldn't carry over despite, I mean, it was perfectly framed and mm. quite beautifully shot. It just didn't, didn't get there. It just didn't reach the, the heights that this film could have. Yes. I think if that had happened on stage, on two sides of the stage in a drop spot, one, two, as a moment, that would have looked potentially quite visually startling and visually beautiful. 
as the history fan, mm -hmm. what was your take on the film? Well, okay, so first things first, virtually everybody got very aerated about the staged meeting between Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth I in the barn. The, the shots that look so beautiful, there is no historical evidence that any meeting ever took place between these two women. In fact, the vast majority of the historical records agree that these two women never met and perhaps had they met in person then the course of events may have been averted. So that's quite problematic. Other choices that are made, so for example Mary Queen of Scots speaking with a quite broad Scots accent. Well Mary Queen of Scots went to France when she was a very small child she had a French mother, Mary of Guise. Her Scots father died when she was merely weeks old. The vast influence in her life would have been France and the French. If she spoke with any accent, spoke English rather with any accent, it would have been French. In terms of the events and the motivations behind the events as they occurred, what I will say is that all history, it's not a science, it's all down to interpretation. And Arguably, except for a few moments, the way the events play out and the motivations behind how those events play out is open to interpretation. They chose interpretations that are arguably correct. My problem is that in the interpretations they chose, they took a very broad brushstroke to history. They oversimplified events and characters. There are, of course, some things that are patently wrong in their oversimplification, particularly some of the text that comes up at the beginning and end of the film, where they talk about um, Mary's death. And it's not a spoiler alert. We know she's executed. Uh, where well, they talk about Mary Queen of Scots' death and they say that her threat to Elizabeth's throne ends. I would, for example, categorically disagree with that because Mary is executed the year before the Spanish Armada is launched and Mary's execution is the reason, ostensibly, that the Spanish Armada is launched. I think to say that Mary's death ends the threat to Elizabeth's throne and life is such a gross oversimplification. She can't sit on the throne, but she becomes a figurehead for a large-scale Spanish invasion force. I mean, frankly, her death is far more dangerous than her alive. Elizabeth seems to be constantly aware of what is happening. She says, don't tell me any more of this, but she's ex essentially accepting the scheming machinations of both her loyal counsellors and her rebel lords. Whereas, on the other hand, Mary Queen of Scots is presented as being consistently in the dock. That if only they'd spoken to her, perhaps she'd have a way out of things. She is essentially schemed against and Elizabeth is scheming. And I think that that's really a, a really simplistic way of presenting this very complex history and this very complex family dynamic. I do remember reading a review where somebody said the takeaway from this film should be uh, women aren't very smart and men are abusive. Oh, yeah, um, that's perhaps reductive, but not, not a million miles from the truth. However, what I will say in terms of Mary Queen of Scots relationships in general, so she is shipped off to France when she's a very, very small girl. She marries the Dauphin um, when she is, I believe, 15. Um, he becomes king within the year and then dies very soon after. He's quite sickly. We don't think that they ever consummated that marriage. She is then shipped back to Scotland she comes back and she is in want of a husband. And so her first husband in Scotland, so after she comes back from being the uh, French king's wife, she ends up married to her first cousin, Lord Darnley. And I've heard it said of Darnley that he is, in many ways, that typical boyfriend that your mother warns you about. He behaves beautifully on the first date. He can act the chivalrous man, but once his feet are under the table... He's a nasty sort. He's a drunk, that we believe. He's power hungry. And I think 
what Mary saw in him, whether it's the fact that he's a Catholic, that he strengthens the claim of herself and any children they have to the throne of England, whether it's pure physical lust for this wonderful long lad, as he is called, that he's rather beautiful and lovely, whatever motivates her into this relationship, I think she marries in haste and regrets at leisure. That's the way I see it. He then is involved in some way with the death of her dear friend and advisor, Rizzio. Most historians agree that his jealousy motivates the Lords of Scotland to murder, to come into a pregnant Mary's room, rip her dear friend from her arms, he was apparently clinging to her skirt, and brutally stab him in front of her. Now, I think that most women wouldn't enjoy seeing a person that they care about, a dear friend, being stabbed something like 58 times in front of them. But to be have this happen when you are six, seven months pregnant, that must be utterly terrifying. And then, for whatever reason, that marriage ends in explosion and suffocation. Darnley is found... The rooms he'd been staying in have blown up and he is smothered. Now, what role Mary has in that is, again, unclear. But it is presumed that the man who orchestrates it, or who is believed to orchestrate it, then, in some way or another, coerces Mary to marry again. Now, in the film, that has a degree of violence to it. It is most certainly a rape. And that doesn't necessarily deviate from some of the historical interpretation that she is kidnapped and forced into a sexual relationship, becomes pregnant and is then forced to marry. All of these men have their eyes on a crown. I mean, that's what seems to motivate everybody. And I think that there is, a, there is an element of historical truth to that. And I think that that is one of the things that Elizabeth is so keen to avoid. She won't make a subject her husband because then she makes him her king. And if she marries a foreign ruler, which is difficult, as she's Protestant and the majority of Europe at this time is Catholic, to marry a foreign prince makes not only her subject, but potentially her subject subject. It's very, very dangerous to be a queen at this time. Because if you want to produce an heir, there's a price to pay. I imagine that was probably... <clears throat> I know one of the... Uh, the, the attractive topics to look at in this film. We have two women at the same time, similar um, destinies or fates that await them. Yeah. And how do they make decisions in that? And we're shown two very different ways of approaching it. Absolutely. <clears throat> and I think for me, my biggest problem is this film is called Mary Queen of Scots. Now, while I think that Margot Robbie does a phenomenal job playing Elizabeth, there is something about setting up that binary that I think is also reductive. And, and quite why, in a film called Mary Queen of Scots, Elizabeth I is a co-leading character. I don't know if it's a case that they didn't trust the story of Mary Queen of Scots to do all of the business, which I think is really a vast underestimation of the power of this character. I mean, I just think that in films about Elizabeth, both Mary Tudor and Mary Stuart, Mary Queen of Scots, are bit part players. They are, they are barely supporting roles. Quite why Mary wasn't given that same potential and power, I think is, is a great shame. I think to have not seen any of her life in France, what made this girl into this woman, to then as well, I think the most crashing and largest mistake made by this film is that we go from Mary coming into England and being placed in somebody's custody to her execution. All of the years of her imprisonment in England, all of her machinations and plots and schemes, and also her descent, we believe, into quite a deep depression, may be spurred on by an illness, potentially porphyria, that would ravage the English houses um, in later centuries. We think that the porphyria might be start with Mary Queen of Scots. All of that is missing. To not see her incarceration, what it enables, it enables that execution for her to go to it as a martyr, which she does. She rips off her dress and she's wearing martyr's red. 
I do think this is one one of those films where they could have benefited uh, from either doing a series or films or maybe just focusing on particular parts of the story. Yes. I mean, if it was me making this film, I would start the film in her imprisonment, her captivity in England, and the things that happened before would happen in flashback. So I think we've laid out from our particular respective positions how we approached the film and started talking a little bit about how we received the film. I guess all that leaves is for us to come down on whether we recommend this film or not. Is it a bad film? Probably closer to yes than to no, in my opinion. I think it's eminently forgettable. Yes. We've been spoiled. We had the favourite earlier this year. Which was just so gorgeous. I was expecting better things from the Queen, Mary Queen of Scots. Yes, I was too. I wouldn't say don't ever see it. It's not, it's not that woeful. If it comes up on TV and you fancy giving it a look, go for it. It's almost out of cinemas now, so this probably isn't going to be that much of an issue. But I wouldn't recommend spending, well, it's what now, £15 to go and see a film in the cinema? And if you're in the West End, closer to 20 25 I wouldn't recommend spending that kind of money on going to see this film. If you've been to see Mary Queen of Scots, we'd love to know what you thought of it. So do let us know in the comments section down below or come and find me over on my social media. That'll be linked in the description box and you can follow me and continue the conversation over there. We hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please let us know by clicking the like button. Please also subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I look forward to seeing you all in the next video and you look forward to seeing them all, I'm sure, in the next film review video, whenever that next goes up. Look forward to it. Absolutely. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and that you will take care of yourself. But for now, from both of us, bye-bye.